Brought to you by Accenture Extended Reality. This is Field of View. Hello and welcome to Field of View. My name is Nicola Rosa from Accenture. And my name is Daniel Colleani from the Academy of International Extended Reality. And uh, today with us, we have a very special guest. But uh, before we start, uh, Daniel, would you like to give an introduction about our podcast and where people can find our recordings in our podcast? Yeah, sure. So just as a quick reminder, this podcast is brought to you by Accenture and uh, and the Academy of International Extended Reality. And it's all about being able to talk about, uh, you know, the, the world of extended reality and bring on really interesting guests, not just to talk about uh, the world of, of our industries, but also, you know, find out a little bit more about them, how they got into the space and how you can apply that to your own life as well. And Nick, to today, I mean, you're, we're speaking to someone who you've actually in another life have previously worked with, right? Yeah, correct. Basically, another life was about 12 years ago. Uh, ages we worked ago. together ages ago. Uh, I just arrived in London by then, and uh, I was my first job in London for Spotify. And I had the pleasure to meet this uh, incredible person uh, that has a fantastic CV, worked for some of the most exciting uh, companies and startups uh, in the tech industry. We're talking about Spotify, we're talking about Skype, or we're talking about Kayak. And uh, today we're going to talk about augmented and virtual reality, in particular augmented reality. And it's a pleasure for me to announce that we have a Blipper CEO, Faisal Galaria, with us. Hi, Faisal. How are you doing? Hi, guys. Uh, hi, hi, Nick. Hi, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this podcast. Absolute pleasure. It's, it's good to see you. It's been a long time, huh? It, it, it has been. And uh, we've been talking about getting together for a, uh, for a bite to eat or a drink. Um, and we should definitely do that uh, in person very soon. Yeah, we can so, celebrate the end of this pandemic lockdown. <laughs> so Faisal, there, there, what's, what's going to, let's just kind of get like uh, this out the way first. I think what's really interesting is you're coming from, from a company which a lot of people in our world particularly know about, has previously had, you know, difficulties and troubles. And then you've kind of come on board, right, to, to, to really kind of refocus the brand and, and kind of, um, kind of to, to allow it to really shine. Absolutely, I, I, you know the the story of Blip, of Blipper. If you're in the XR world, is is very well well known. It's a it's a former tech unicorn that was incredibly well well funded, that was super successful, um, you know, pi- that pioneered aug- augmented reality back in 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 2011. You know when we were still using two and a half G networks and the and the very first smart smartphones. Um, you know, but we've the co- the company has pivoted, and that's been well well, well doc- documented. Um, what's really exciting is you know, joining uh, the company two, two years ago to have the opportunity to to join a, a, a company that has been so iconic, that's based here in in London, that's that's a real deep technology company, and have the chance to rebuild that because you know these opportunities don't come around very, very often. And I'm, you know, I feel very honored um, that um, the team brought, brought me on um, to, to lead this, this iconic turnaround where, you know, we're at the start, um, we've made some, some great progress. Um, but, you know, we've got a, you know, if Skype, Kayak and Spotify taught me anything, it's that, you know, the, you know, the next five to seven years are going to be really where the rubber hits the road. And Faisal, uh, obviously, uh, this uh, adventure in Bleepar is uh, your last adventure, but uh, uh, your uh, history, uh, your work history is uh, full of uh, uh, a lot of success. And uh, you work for very important companies and very well-known companies. You had some very successful exits. Uh, would you like to give us a little bit of a background of yourself? We like to talk about the origin story of our guests. So uh, we know that you have a past uh, uh, as in competitive uh, athletics. Uh, and uh, and then you worked, of course, for all those uh, amazing startups. Would you like to give us a little bit of an overview about yourself? Sure. Um, uh, you, you pointed out that um, in, in my prior life, um, I, I was a, a, a competitive athlete and used to, to run 400 meters uh, as a UK junior and uh, as a UK senior. And I did that uh, for about... 10 years from being a teenager, 13 or 14, uh, right the way through, through, uh, through university. And, and then had to make a, a choice in my, in my twenties about whether to double down and, and, and try to be a uh, professional athlete, professional 400 meters runner, 
uh, or or go into the you know get a get a real job and uh, and, and uh, join the world of of um, uh, you know of, of, in my case it was Arthur Anderson. Um, but I, you know, I was very it was a, an amazing time. Um, you know, and athletics and the four hundred meters is a uh, is a great training ground for uh, building uh, you know learning how to deal with resilience, picking yourself up, training. Um, you know, and coming to to each each race um, with uh, you know, with great determination and 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 with the with the idea that you can win each time, um, and that's a lot of what I use today. I think in, in terms of the perspectives that I I bring to to the uh, to some of the companies that I've been with and some of the missions that we've been on. That's, uh, that's so you. You've been able to transfer this uh, uh, kind of a competitive mindset and uh, professional athlete mindset into the business that you're doing. Absolutely, there's a lot that's transferable. I think you know the mental resilience that that you need to have as a competitive uh, athlete, because even if you're Usain Bolt, you don't win every race, and you need to come back the following week and 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 put yourself on the line again. Um, mean you know you build a real mental resilience. And the other thing that's really interesting is, you know, the, the way that you train is, um, you, know, you, you train for peak events. And, you know, at the moment we have the Olympics that are, that are coming up this, this summer, which means the athletes that are, that, are, that are training for that have been preparing for the last three or four years for that one peak event. And that's very similar to the way that I, I you know, um, you know, thought about my, my career in that I, I go hard for three or four years in a particular particular company, uh, and then you need to stop because you can't continue at that pace in, in, indefinitely, and you need an off off season. And so, if you look back, uh, there have been three to four year, uh, you know, en endeavors, and then I, you know, then I take a, a couple of months off, um, uh, have my off season, um, recover, uh, have have a have a massage, and then go back. What, what 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 do you like to do during your off time? What are your hobbies? What what do you like doing? Um, I like to tra you know I, I travel a lot for work, but traveling for pleasure is is quite different. Um, um, and so I have a, a an ongoing love affair with Spain. Uh, I was educated in in Spain. Uh, I so you know first time round in in Cordoba in the south of Spain, uh, which is uh, I have a fascination for given its uh, Islamic and Moorish history. And then I did my MBA in Barcelona, which is one of the most fun cities in the world. Um, with prop, you know, you can go to the beach in the summer and ski in, in, in the winter. Um, has you know, has great food. Uh, it's a great place to spend some time. So I I try to to spend as much time as I can in in Spain. Um, I'm also the father of of three. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, so um, you know when I do. And by have, the way, congratulations for your newborn baby. Thank you very much. Layla is uh, four week, four weeks old, uh, but um, th th you know that means there isn't a great deal of of free time anymore. You know, and, and taking the little ones to their tennis classes and their and their football clubs and swimming classes you know, takes uh, takes you know what little free time um, you know that there might be, but it's a uh, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be able to uh, to do those things. So a lot, lot of people. The... Sorry, go on. I was, I was going to say, so, I mean, a, a lot of people that will be listening or watching to this then will be listening to you about, you know, making this this early career in, and, and um, kind of pushing to kind of professional uh, athlete and then kind of moving then in, more into the business world. I mean, I, I'm sure that you might get this question asked a lot, but how does that transition look like from going from that kind of world to in 2004 being, you know, the GM slash, you know, European director for, for Skype, for example? You know, for, for for me, as I said, it, the, the the transition came um, you know, after after university. I was um, I, I was on the cusp of of a professional career in in athletics um, and had to make a choice about um, what I what I did did post university, um, and I was um, on the edge of of the UK seniors. Seniors team uh, running against some 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 of the the now greats of the 400 meter and, and UK UK athletics, um, and had to make a choice about whether 
that was going to be what I dedicated myself to. And I knew what that looked like, having spent the previous 10 years uh, training and as, as a UK junior, as a, as, a, you know, as, a, as a county runner, as a North of England runner, as a, as a UK, you know, as I said, as a UK junior, I knew what that, that looked like and I knew the path that that was going to take. I also knew I wasn't getting any taller. You know, and uh, there's, there's a there was a there's a limit to uh, perhaps there's a limit to how fast uh, I was I was going to go. And at that point, I was running 400 meters in about 48 seconds. Um, so you know maybe I could have got a second or a, or two seconds faster, but that still wouldn't have put me in the top four, the elite of the UK 400 meters runners. So I'm still going to be outside that. Um, and so the pragmatic part of me um, kicked in um, and said, look, uh, you know that. If that's not going to happen, then I'm, you know, I, I need to, uh, I need to, to, to do something else. Um, and I was at university at, at, in Manchester at the time at UMIST at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Te Technology, which wasn't far away from my club, uh, my athletics club, Carnegie in, in Leeds, where I where I grew up. Um, and I was very fortunate um, during my time at, at UMIST um, to have gone on and you know, to be to have had the opportunity to do a number of stagiaires or internships with companies like Mars, um, Mark, Marks and Spencer and Ford. And so when athletics, you know, when it became obvious that I wasn't going to become uh, a full-time athlete, that wasn't going to be my career, um, you know, I had this fallback, which was going, in, it, going into business. I was, I was a pretty good um, economic student. I was a, you know, I was a fair, fair to middling uh, you know, university student who spent more time in the gym on, and on the track than in in, lecture, in lectures. Um, but I was offered the opportunity to join Arthur Anderson in their strategic consulting, strategy, finance, and economics practice in London, um, which felt like the right thing to do. It was kind of the opportunity to uh, to look at an, around at a number of of businesses uh, rather than go into a you know into a a, a Mars or a uh, or, a, or, or, or a Marks and Spencer full, full time. The idea of being a strategy consultant and having, having a look at a lot of things appealed because up until that point, I, I thought I was going to be an athlete. So I hadn't really given uh, enough thought to what company uh, or what function I would, might do in a professional career. Okay. <laughs> and, then, and then when you look at something like that, then I guess... You know, you can, if you've, you've then been able to progress quite quite quickly, I guess, from from something like that into, you know, getting in really early doors into places like, you know, Skype, for example. And, and what's really interesting, I was speaking with Nick around this, is looking at your CV, the kind of places you've been at vary quite a lot. I mean, when you look at Skype through to Kayak and, and now into kind of Blipper and stuff. So, you know, what, what, what I mean, I'm interested to both learn, I guess, what it's like moving into kind of an early stage and uh, kind of uh, kind of scale up type organization and then also i guess you know what what's the kind of things that appeal to you when you're you know choosing these places that you want to you know kind of kind of work with as well yeah it's interesting that you say they're all quite different because i think they're all quite similar there's a there's a thread or a narrative which perhaps you can only uh, pick up looking looking backwards like it's certainly not something that that I at least started out look, looking for but the for, for me that the, the you know what the, the narrative is businesses that are that are going through massive disruption and companies that are at the at the forefront of that uh, and the disruption is being caused by a number of different things uh, but key to all of them is telecoms disruption so in the case of, of Skype back in the uh, early 2000s, the big disruption uh, was the rollout of, of broadband, home, home broadband. You know, and there was H.264, there was audio, audio, comp audio compression uh, session initiated protocol and peer-to-peer. -peer -peer. But if you then think through to what next at, at Spotify, it was the 3G was again the network bearer. That was the, that was the similarity. There was some peer-to-peer, -peer, there, was, there was music compression, there was uh, the iPod and the, and the and the network allowed the iPod to become an, an iPhone. There was Facebook, which became the the, the big viral um, growth engine. But the commonality was you know, is really um, 
you know, the, the the network in a, in a, in a new fast and disruptive way. And then if you look now at, at, at Blipper, you know, so you know, ten year ten years later, with the with the rollout now, and we'd be at right at the beginning of of five G rollout across the world. You know, if you if you look at colliding ecosystems, so in the case you know, in, in the case of Blipper, we have we have AR kits and AR core, the, the the native tech stacks for AR being rolled out into every phone, AR glasses, five five G, the massive investments that some of the American companies are making in AR uh, software and, and hardware, and even Google uh, integrating AR into native mobile search. To me, they, these are almost predictable patterns where you can see colliding ecosystems with the network, the bearer at the heart of it, creating big disruption. Um, and so when you look back on, on that, it, you can almost see, see, you know, there are these predictable patterns and, and you can see that something is going to change you know, in this fourth wave of, of computing. So from, from desktops to internet to, to mobile, to what we're now seeing, the beginning of a, of a fourth wave, it's, uh, you know, I look at it as, as being you know, somewhat predictable. And it's not to say that Blipper is, you know, is going to be the only winner, but we're definitely at the right place at the right time with the right technology and the right team. But it seems to me that uh, every single company that you joined before was uh, on the verge of exploding. We're talking about Skype with uh, the creation of new networking protocol and the advent of broadband. And uh, obviously with Spotify, with uh, the, uh, the advent of 3G and the streaming music business. And now, uh, Blipar, do, do, when do you think this, uh, you know, uh, big bang moment for AR will happen because a lot of people have been talking about this for the last six years and it still has to happen. And what's your prediction? Is it something that is uh, one year away, three years away, five years away, 10 years away? What's what's your vision on this? So you must have a plan for that. I, I think it's already happening, Nick. Um, you know, Microsoft just a couple of weeks ago announced a $22 billion deal with the with, with the U S government. And to put that into context, that's more revenue in one deal than snap Twitter and Instagram combined. So it's already happening, right? At the same time, uh, you've got companies like, like Facebook that are announcing that 20% of their team are now working on AR and, 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 and VR and Tim Cook, you know, said on, on, uh, on a, on a podcast recently with, with Cara Swisher that, that AR was uh, fundamental to the future of, of AR and more so than uh, electric vehicles. So this is almost like day one. And, and the way I would characterize it, Nick, is I remember you know, back in 2003 in, early, in very early Skype, when I said yep. to people, we're going to be having calls, uh, you know, telephone calls on computers and we're going to put headphones on and we're going to connect up to, to home broadband and have phone calls that way. And they went, that's weird. Why, why would you do that? And of course you roll forward 10 or 15 years and you know, Skype, uh, well, voice over IP now probably accounts for over 25% of all the long distance calls. And we're all super familiar now, of course, with do doing Zoom calls and, and call calls like this. So I think we're at day one, um, you know, this is a, now, this is a 10 to 15 year uh, cycle and we're pretty er er early in it. But my God, this is going to have profound impacts just, just in the same way as you know, going from, from uh, desktop computing to, 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 uh, to the mobile phone, changing everything. I think over the next 10, 10 to 15 years, as we go from mo the mobile phone to a, to a new form of, of, um, of computing interface, where rather than having a screen and a and a keyboard in front of you, the internet is around you, uh, and you don't have a keyboard, and you're controlling it through through voice and, and neural links. It's it's going to be a whole new internet.
A lot of companies are starting to take, you know, augmented reality a lot more seriously now and, and invested in, well, they've probably been investing for quite some time. But, you know, when we talk about where Apple were going with in, integrating, you know, LiDAR sensors into all their devices, which as many would know is really just the first stepping stone for data collection in terms of being able to build a, a much more powerful device that can integrate that technology. But then you also look at, you know, companies like Snap, for example, who have launched their things like uh, local lenses and, and being able to uh, have their landmark kind of markers as well with devices and things like that what what's i guess for those those listening as well what's the the, the kind of difference where the blip sees itself compared to where you know maybe instagram and snapchat are taking the markets as well so there there are a couple of dif differences in, and you mentioned some of the social uh, platforms uh, one of the big differences between uh, you know what what blipper does um and what what they do is we are really focused on on utility ar experiences uh, and by that, what I mean is, we'll work with companies like like Porsche to put a Porsche in your in your driveway, so that you can configure that Porsche or that Tesla or that or that Audi, uh, change the color, see the size of it, and it's volumetrically correct. Uh, you you can you know fully configure the the, the in, interior, the exterior, the the tires, uh, and get that ordered, uh, which is quite different from some of the fun. Uh, experiences that you might have on the, on the social network. This is, we're talking about real in-depth um, ut utilities. Um, and the other, you know, one of the other, other big difference is we're cross-platform. Um, so when you build on, on, on the, on the Blipper platform, you can publish to, to any, uh, or, or at least several uh, plat platforms, including some of the, some of the social networks. Um, but it means that you can build once and publish anywhere and onto any device. So we're, we're not only uh, publisher agnostic, but we're also device agnostic. Does this mean that so, then Blip is more going to be more of a behind the scenes tool then rather than more of a front facing tool? Or? Um, I would say we are a uh, behind the scenes. So we're a B2B uh, uh, content creation plat platform and, and studio, but we're also a backwards facing camera company, if that makes sense. So whereas the social networks are, are really all about front facing camera, you know, increasingly there are a, a number of cameras on the back of the phone. And what's really interesting for us is how do we augment the world around the user and not focus entirely on, 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 on the face. Uh, there's a limit, there's a limit to, we think to what can be done that way. And, and you know, and people really want, um, you know, to to augment and, and to make the world around them more immersive, more compelling, and, and that creates some of the opportunities that that Nick was talking about, whether that's in in real estate or or, or healthcare or or education or, or e-commerce. And I have a question for you, Faisal. Um, there's um, been um, sort of a buzzword that has been going for. Uh, couple of years, 2018 and 2019 in the XR world, that was cloud XR. So creating a persistent map of the world and uh, a very few company have been able to manage to do something like this. I know that uh, uh, Microsoft right now is working on uh, some of uh, a similar solution with their Azure cloud, uh, mixed reality cloud. Uh, Niantic uh, acquired 60.ai recently and uh, they announced their new platform uh, for, to create uh, this metaverse uh, in in uh, in AR. Uh, I wanted to have your take about cloud uh, cloud AR and uh, to understand if you see the future of AR being persistent uh, as the one that Niantic and uh, other companies are looking uh, to to create. You know, uh, cloud uh, is such a, a wide term. You know, and and you pointed out that you know one one aspect of it, which is the which is a persistent AR uh, in, in environment, um, and that's going to be you know and there's companies like Ni Niantic that that you mentioned that are in investing very heavily in there. What I'm more interested in when we talk about cloud AR is how that will enable uh, a whole new category of of phones and users to have the best, the most exciting, vivid AR experience. Because when, when you're not relying on the phone processor 
to do all of, all of, all of, all of the computation and rendering and when you can when you can do a lot of that in the cloud and and stream back images so a compressed image co uh, encoded back to the phone and it's, de and it's uh, decoded on, on 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 the phone that's a very light process but that could create uh, really compelling ar but on the most simple of phones so in terms of making ar widely accessible to everyone whether you know whether we're talking about somebody using a 40 dollar phone uh, in Indonesia, or a uh, you know, or, or someone who you know, who's using MPSA in in Kenya uh, on, a, on a on a on a cheap smartphone. What I'm most interested in is how does AR become completely ubiquitous uh, and, and change the way that people interact with the internet. And, and definitely, cloud AR means that the devices don't need to be you know thousand dollar smartphones yeah. with, to work on. Some of the cheaper, so cheaper smartphones. You, you, you're mentioning the cloud rendered AR. Uh, I, I, the, 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 the question that I made was more about um, uh, create a persistent map of the world so you can create persistent augmentation in the world. Like, for example, you can have an augmentation that is permanently uh, attached to a specific kind of building and so on. So uh, this is this is what 6D.ai uh, was doing, and that's why Niantic has acquired the company. But yeah, absolutely. Cl Cloud-rendered XR is going to be a big part of this revolution. And when 5G will arrive, <laughs> uh, hopefully will arrive very soon. And now people are start, started talking about 6G already. Uh, while we're waiting for a, a great coverage, this is going to be absolutely important. And uh, one thing, Faisal, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, what is the most difficult thing that you had to do when you joined Blipar? I mean, I'm very interested in understanding how you've been able to refocus the company uh, in uh, such a good way as you did, because of course the company now is doing quite well, apparently, as, as we're seeing. Uh, and, and what's the, your, your thought process in, in, in entering also a, a new kind of stream of business, because you worked in the telecommunication before, then you worked in music, and now you work in, in augmented and virtual reality. So how, how did you, uh, What's the, the 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 mind structure that you had when you started refocusing the company? What what's the kind of process that you followed by then? Um, you know, Blipper has been around for you know over over a decade, and 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 during that time, developed a, a number of market leading capabilities. Whether that was in um, you know computer vision, visual search, uh, or, or augmented reality. Um, and one of the things that that struck me when I when I joined is that we we really had to figure out where we were going to focus and what we were going to what we were going to be famous for. Um, and uh, and it's very difficult as a startup or a scale up to be to be famous and very good at everything. So part of what I did when I joined was to, to take a really close look at at what assets we had, what capabilities. We had what were our what where where was our technology moat? Um, what did our what was our team best at? But also um, where the market was going and where the opportunities were, because you know, building we're not a, we're not an R and D company. So what we're trying to do is find real commercial opportunities where we had a uh, where we had a. Uh, a real advantage, a, a you know, a, an advantage because of the investment in the technology and people that's been made. But you had quite a lot of patents already. We've got a, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of patents, a lot of technology, a lot of assets, uh, and you know they're across the board. Whether it was in in visual search or augmented reality, but we had to choose. Um, we had to choose. We had to choose based upon what we were good at, the assets and technology that we had. And where the market and where the market opportunity was going, and so it's a it's an exercise, you know, of prioritization of of, of understanding where do we have uh, real competitive advantage, and where where is the market going, and channeling the company in, in that direction. You know, and we have uh, we had a great team uh, that had built AR that had made AR work, you know, on a two and a half G network on 
on the uh, on the most basic of, of smartphones. We had over 10 years worth of patents in augmented reality. You know, and even two years ago, coming coming into this space, it you know it, it was becoming increasingly obvious that AR was was starting to happen, and so it became a natural choice to take what we you know what Blipper was good at, and actually what its provenance was, what it got started doing uh, back in 2011, and doubled down purely on, on that. So we're now a very very focused augmented reality content creation platform and studio that that focuses on on halo uh, executions that to demonstrate what the capability of the of the ar content platform actually is so so what was that hardest decision i guess if you had to like boil boil down like, i guess that that into something you know what not to do is probably the an answer, Daniel, because you know we could have done we could have gone in a, in a number of different ways in over ten years, and you know there there was you know there was the opportunity to do lots and lots of things, and look, we had you know that that could have been um, you know it, it could have been computer vision, doubling down on computer vision, on machine learning, uh, uh, visual search, or augmented reality. We had to figure out what what we were going to be famous for. Um, so it's actually probably deciding what not mm. to do um, and building a team and focusing all of the energy that, uh, 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 and what we'd built before and, and, and not doing the things that we weren't going to focus on. Uh, and, so and, and you did some remarkable things. Uh, shall we talk a little bit about the OnePlus launch that has been created on your platform? That was quite of a remarkable achievement, I have to say. That that was a lot of fun, um, and uh, One OnePlus have become uh, great great clients with whom we work uh, now very very closely. Now the 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 exam question there was uh, that was posed to, to us was uh, normally OnePlus would do a would do a phone launch, and in this case the Nord phone launch uh, in an exhibition center with with hundreds or, or thousands of, of, of journalists, and that might be in. Shenzhen or, or, or San Francisco, but you know, at this time last last year, trying to get a thousand journalists to, to Shenzhen or, or San Francisco, of course, wasn't possible because of lockdown. So the exam question they said to us was, "Look, we're, we're launching these Nord phones, which are five G phones. Uh, they have great screens that have that have uh, uh, great processing capabilities and cameras. Could we use augmented reality?" to create a, a stage you know for every journalist wherever they are rather than then coming to our stage in Shenzhen or, or, or San Francisco would that be possible um, and we we took it away and, and they described what they wanted which was essentially to recreate a half an hour extravaganza where the CEO comes onto the stage you know there, there are videos playing there are multiple speakers and at the end of it, there's a, a hurrah moment where the where the phone appears, and then and then you can see the phone. And, and uh, but it's a multimedia video, in person live experience. But it was all live, and it was all synchronized. Absolutely. So it, we we uh, brought it was the world's first AR broadcast. Um, it was initially commissioned for a thousand journalists. Uh, people then started so. OnePlus fans started to demand access to to this, so they asked us to to uh, increase the size of the audience to five thousand people. People then started trading those invites um, on 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 eBay and on Amazon. And at which point, Amazon also started uh, filming what was going on. So there's actually a uh, th there's a documentary that you can get on on Amazon Prime, which shows the story of the launch of of the uh, of the Nord. Nord phone, which is which is great, uh, but in the end, um, because this was all digital, we we opened it up, um, and for the thirty minutes of the of the launch, six hundred and seventy two thousand people tuned in simultaneously for a, the world's first AR wow. AR broadcast. And why that's important is this is not video where everyone sees the same broadcast, because it was AR. 
everyone saw a broadcast which was dimensioned according to where they were and where they were viewing it. So if you were in your office and you and this, you put the stage on your on your desk, it would be dimensioned according to the size of your your desk. But if you were you know um, at your breakfast table and you had you know the whole of the kitchen or, or the lounge, you could actually fill the whole of the lounge with with the with with the um, uh, with, with Carl Pei, who was a CEO. Uh, there on on stage and so everybody had a unique bespoke experience um and it was uh, as i said it, it was seen by 672,000 people which was uh, 27,000 terabits worth of in, information that we that we sent around the globe um which on the day means that we sent around more more in, internet data than india created that day um, so it was a huge, wow. huge undertaking. We created a, a bespoke CDN with 12 points of presence around the world to ensure that every one of those 672,000 people got a unbroken experience. Um, and, you know, and then it was subsequently shown uh, on, um, on YouTube, so the number of influencers who filmed their live 30-minute experience. And so I believe that all told, about seven million people have now seen that that launch. It, be, it made uh, it helped make um, the Nord Phone um, sell, sell out and and one of uh, one of OnePlus's most successful phone launches. That's absolutely and, uh, insane. <laughs> And I mean, let's let's remind our uh, viewers uh, that uh, there's a documentary about it on Amazon. Is is it on Amazon Video? It's on Amazon Amazon Video. Uh, if you search for OnePlus Nord, uh, you'll be able to find it. Find it there. It's a. Uh, I think you can actually find it on on YouTube. So it's chunked up into into I think four episodes on on YouTube as well. But if you search for OnePlus Nord, but uh, the whole of the documentaries is uh is available on on um, amazon video so is it safe to say then that you know uh, with everything that's been going on in the world this pandemic and, and the cancellation of certain events and all these different things and the, the change of how we work as well has uh, accelerated the adoption of this technology or, or enabled you guys to do more than you normally would be able to do the the lockdown and particularly um you know the fact that people weren't able to go out and, and and shop, for example, as much as as uh, as they might have done in in physical retail, changed the you know, changed the game. Um, you know, we've seen uh, e-commerce uh, go through the roof, and I think it was uh, Mike Moritz at Sequoia that said we've seen five years of technology acceleration months during lockdown, and part of that is is clearly what we've seen happen in in e-commerce. Uh, but e-commerce really pops and becomes visually exciting and compelling and we can see when when you apply augmented reality to, to e-commerce you can get eight times the uh, uh, the engagement and, and up to 40 percent more conversion uh, than on a flat 2d version so all of a sudden uh, ar has you know has found a real use case in, in, in e-commerce e but you know just the fact that we're in lockdown and people were were, were, were starting to use QR codes. Um, you know, QR codes, as we all know, is one of the triggers for an augmented reality experience, just meant that the familiarity with the trigger experience, uh, the QR code has become, everyone knows exactly what to do and how to scan a QR code. So undoubtedly it's had an accelerating effect, but it's it's part of the colliding um, forces, you know, that, we, that we've discussed before. And I think it's definitely one of the, one of the important uh, accelerants. So, Nika, as well, I, I'm sure uh, I really want to get onto like future and, and I guess you know where this technology is taking us. But there's just one one question that I want to get out of the way where it comes to just kind of business first, and and then I guess we can touch on some of the the future sort of things and I guess where that takes us. But um, one question that's going to be on people's minds with such an expert like you in the room is, uh, I guess, what would you say uh, your like, uh, let's just put an arbitrary number on it, like you know top top six or something um like principles or something that you would take with you 
to see success in any you know company that you might work with because i'm sure you've over time you probably built up some fundamental like uh, kind of principles that you probably have in your mind so i'm just keen to see for any of those other startups out there any co-founders ceos that are listening to this that you know might be able to take some principles home with them as well i'm going to have to disappoint you daniel with with six because i'm probably not smart enough to come up with, with six. <laughs> but I, I do have three um uh, and and the first one is is technology. It's you know, technology and product. Um, you know, it, inevitably, uh, you've got to have great technology and and great great product, um, and that's fundamental to to success. And it's 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 part of the way I screen not only uh, where I spend my time as an executive, but also companies that I invest in. Um, so that's no, number one. Uh, number two is the team. Um, you know, and even with the best technology, the you know the team. If you haven't got a great team, um, you, 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 it's going to be very difficult for that to, to break out. And you really cannot underestimate the you know the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into making any technology break out and and, and be successful. And a, and a great team uh, is fu- is fundamental. So uh, you know, and, and in Blipper we had great technology and and, uh, and a great AR team. Um, and then the third one is, is something that you can't legislate for, but you can look out for, and that's timing. Uh, and, you know, and if you look at Skype, Kayak, Kayak, Spotify, and now Blipper, they're really um, you know products of their time. And if you get the timing right, uh, you know that that you know that that's critical. And if you get the the timing wrong, which is what happened you know first time round in, in blipper then the technology could be great the uh, the team could be great but if the ecosystem's not ready it doesn't really matter um, and so technology team and timing are, are the are the three um the three t's uh, yeah. how, how would you yeah. go about actually achieving those then like you know how would you go about finding you know the, the, the a good team and uh, you know a good time and and uh, okay, well, we've already established that's a bit harder but and then good technology um, well, you know, good good technology is a, is a, is a case of uh, for, is a case of doing a lot of diligence. Um, you know, understanding um, you know, where the technology is going, making sure that that there's, you know, there's good product market fit, uh, making sure that the product is is, is a, and uh, and technology is, is scalable. Um, so you know, it's, it's typical due diligence that you would do on on technology. And, and team is is you know, arguably harder. You know, with with technology, it, it, you know, it's um, you 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 can be very objective. Um, but with with a, with looking at team, it's very much more of a, a subjective thing. You know, whether a team works well together uh, or not. You know, one of the th- things that was important to me about at looking at Blipper was. Uh, clearly, there was a collection of, of of people that had worked together, that had great experience and had built great things at, at, at Blipper. Uh, so you know, there were definitely some some superstar engineers, product product people, and people that had, had done uh, had great successes. But what's even more important is, can you pull that team together, and do they work well together, or are they a collection of individual stars? Uh, and the collective has to work because you know, I haven't seen a, a company yet work you know, where you had one or two stars, um, you know, but, but the team wasn't great. Uh, and so you need you need great technology and you need a great team. Um, and that's by you know the only way you can figure that out is by spending time time with the, with the team, uh, identifying who the stars are, but but spending time with the team to see look are they really going to to uh, back each other, uh, uh, and are they going to go on this journey together with me as the CEO? Um, you know, that's only something you can only figure out with with by spending t- time with them. So I, it took me six months uh, before I joined Flipper because I had I had to do my due diligence. I have the usual provocative question Next that provocative I asked for all of my all of my guests. So. Um, I have an idea of where the future uh, of retail is going. Um, and this is an idea that's uh, matured 
uh, from you know all the successes that uh, uh, companies like uh, Epic Games are having with Fortnite, with selling of the skins, uh, with uh, all the big wave of non fungible tokens, and uh, obviously all the wave of uh, digital try-ons and the virtual clothing that started to appear on the market. Uh, my view is that there will be uh, very soon uh, a new way of selling items, a new way of selling goods, and people will start buying uh, digital goods to wear them in public and to dress their own house, uh, uh, you know, and, and see them and enjoy them using glasses very soon. Do you think that this is going to happen do you do you share my vision about the future of uh, augmented reality commerce and of uh, digital items 100 percent. you know yeah we we're talking with football clubs at the moment and, and football clubs i think are, are really in, instructive example of what you're talking about because you know you, if you think about a club like um fc barcelona um uh, it has fans all over the world you know, from everywhere from manila from manila to to, to Mexico, uh, and you know, th those fans are passionate, and you might be passionate in in Manila, uh, but trying to get your, you know, you, you're definitely not going to be able to get to the burner, uh, you don't, you're not going to be able to get to the, to the stadium, which is very difficult to get to the stadium, um, and maybe even getting your hands on kit is going to be difficult. So you know, every year there's new kit, but as a fan, you want to get hold of that that kit. Now, if you can get a a digital version of that and dress yourself and share a version of yourself with with everyone that you're connected to and at this point you're describing a, uh, an environment where everyone is digitally connected and you can show your passion for for uh, F fc barcelona uh, by wearing the latest kit and it costs you uh, a few dollars rather than tens of, of of dollars to to show your passion and wear that new kit that's both a whole new revenue stream um, that, that that's you know, a digital revenue that revenue stream that's similar to what's been happening in games for a long time. You know, so dig, you know, di virtual goods have been so sold in gaming for, for a long time, but I think it's starting to come uh, you know, and have much more wider appeal. So, you know, whether it's a pair of digital sneakers uh, or, or, you know, or, or a football or a football kit, the way that you're going to express your identity all over the world and show your passion, show your passions, uh, or you know that could be you know how you stage your house, um, you know how you represent you know your um, the, the the sports that that you're interested in. I'm even thinking about uh, uh, the the fact that very soon television sets uh, will be a thing of the past potentially. Absolutely. What's going to be? You know, there's no need for a television set if you if you've got an if you're wear, if you have an AR wearable and you can see, see you know see the film or the TV um, or, or sculpt, digital sculpture or furniture, all this kind of stuff. Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, you know with, uh, with in your TV example, what's brilliant about that is uh, we're going to get IMAX quality full uh, full screen images pos possible because you're not limited to the 55 or the 65 inch um, you know, TV screen that you have on the wall today it could be it could be you know it could be cinematic quality what I haven't quite figured out yet is how does that become a shared experience right mm -hmm. because um, you know at, at the moment there, there's something nice about sitting down you know after 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 a long day with with my wife and we watch you know an episode of of something on Netflix together, that that joint experience that you know that you get doing that, or in, or indeed going to the cinema, uh, is something that we're going to have to figure out how that happens. Uh, you know, having those joint experiences, which goes back to your early earlier point about the persistent internet. Maybe there's a you know, there's going to be a way that we can share uh, AR and VR experience, AR and VR. Ex experiences and have a common experience but i think that's still being 
Well, I, I th- again, I think it's fascinating because even, you know, you have governments who are investing in being able to figure out those things as well. I mean, in, in, in uh, kind of late kind of 2020, I mean, we, we even found out that the UK government, for example, uh, in part of their 200 million pound kind of fund for kind of 5G and test beds, you know, invested, I think it was with uh, kind of BT and also uh, kind of a few other kind of telecoms and things just in the region of East Anglia in, in the UK, I think it was around 2.5 million to be able to do things like uh, augmented reality boxing matches and to be able to do uh, teach uh, young people uh, all across the UK how to dance, for example. And I think, you know, there's definitely an appetite, even from, uh, you know, uh, kind of DCMS, to be able to fund these kind of things from a government level, which uh, should be able to help accelerate these things as well. Yeah, and I, you know, I, one of the reasons why I'm at, at Lipper is because I, you know, I'm a very strong believer in, the, the the UK tech ecosystem and and Blipper was one of the very first tech unicorns in in, in the United Kingdom. I had the opportunity to live it, you know, in in many places. I was educated and worked in in Spain. I, I spent a long time in in New York and, and and San Francisco. But home is 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 London and and the United Kingdom. So for me, it's really exciting the the investments that the government makes in in te- technology widely uh, digital technologies and AR specifically because you know, we have, you know, there is now a, a, you know, a blipper mafia here in, in the United Kingdom that has, that has you know, pioneered a- a- AR and we have the opportunity to be, uh, to be leading the world in terms of AR and, and, and VR. We've got some great examples of companies um, you know, that 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 have been started here and continue continue to be super successful and leading this space. Um, it's great to be part of that ecosystem. So we're really running out of time now. Um, I don't know, Nick, if you you probably have a few more burning questions, just like me. But I I know that one thing that I think is going to be really important is I guess what is the the roadmap for for yourself for Blipper for the industry? What is the next five years kind of look like? And I don't know, Nick, if you have anything to add on to that. No, I mean, my, my um, question for Faisal is uh, uh, trying to, um, to understand from him how he sees the evolution of the ecosystem for the next few years. Yeah. Because uh, as, as we know right now, the ecosystem is very fragmented. There's no actual real standard for anything. Uh, and there are many platforms that are competing with each other, but uh, uh, very few uh, efforts in order to consolidate the way that experiences are built and experiences are uh, you know, used by the user, the final users. We know that, for example, there are some efforts with uh, OpenXR that is trying to create open API in order to allow or in, uh, interoperability between uh, the experiences and the devices and so on. But I wanted to have uh, a Faisal take about the, the, the future of this. And if he sees, for example, the creation of a unique standard for augmented reality, like, you know, that's been for television or DVDs or any other kind of medium. So standards and, and I guess then what's the, the five years kind of roadmap look like? So I, I think um, we're still uh, you know, a long way from um from standards being being imposed upon upon the industry that tends to happen when uh you know when when regulation gets gets imposed it's very rare uh, in my experience for for competing companies to to impose self-impose a standard uh, or standards upon themselves that's you know that's the jobs of regulators like like the fcc and the uh, and ofcom and that's happened um, in, in telecoms where, where, where I was. Uh, that's not to say, um, however, that interoper- interoperability isn't going to be key to, to making AR and uh, uh, XR, VR, uh, as big as it possibly can be. And actually, that's, uh, to answer your question about where are we going uh, without revealing too much, because um, some, some of this is, is, is in, in the labs and we don't want to talk don't, don't want to give too much of the game away at this early stage, but interoperability is is you know, the ability to be able to create ones uh, and experience uh, that 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 content on any device on any publisher is, is super super important. You know, at the moment, we have a number of walled gardens. Um, you know, the, so you know if you, if you publish on on on, uh, on a social social media platform. 
they don't work on the other social social media platforms. Um, so we think that in, in order for for not only for brands to start investing more meaningfully, but for people to build experiences which which work across um, yeah, the Apple, the the Android, the head mounted devices, AR AR glasses, and across the publishers, there needs to be uh, a way for you to, to build once and uh, and, and publish every, anywhere. And that's you know at the heart of what we're doing at, at Blipper is creating this AR content creation platform which enables that experience for for not only AR enthusiasts but but content developers at, at agencies and brands. No. Fascinating stuff. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I think that we are arrived at the end of our podcast. Uh, I wanted to thank you personally, Faisal. This has been great and it's, uh, it's good to see you. Uh, let's Please let's book some time for us to catch up. Let's have that dinner that we've been talking about and have some drinks here on the terrace in, uh, in London uh, now that the sun is out and it's good. Uh, Daniel, would you like to remind to all of our viewers uh, where they can uh, uh, catch our next episodes and see all the other episodes that are available? Of course. If you want to see our, our lovely faces, then you can actually chat to this on YouTube and, and kind of see the actual video version. We're also, though, on Spotify, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, all the usual places where you might watch uh, or sorry, listen to a podcast. Uh, go ahead and, and, and take a look at that. Check that out. There's many, many episodes now from really fantastic people, um, including everyone from, you know, Star, talking about Star Wars through to um, kind of HTC devices, through to investment, and, and of course, through to, you know, the future of augmented reality like uh, like this podcast so thanks everyone for for catching up on this and uh we'll see you next time on field of you thank you very much bye through accessible insights a solid network of support and recognizing truly outstanding achievements near or far big or small we're in this together aixr